Welcome to another episode of Zusammen. Hi, Zipi. Hi, Zili. And hi, Anad, Professor Anad Vibon from Stony Brook University. Um, and just to tell people that Zusammen is uh, together and we see you every week. And every week we talk with somebody that we think will inspire us. Yeah. And we are very happy to have you, Anad. Um, I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> so, um, by the way, what you're teaching? Um, that's interesting because uh, my position in Storybook is a research position, so I don't have to teach anything. Okay. Uh, what I choose to teach, and I had to apply and get my classes approved, is issues in women's health and gender-based medicine. So I teach a class every year to four-year medical students. And this is the name of the class, Issues in Women's Health and Gender-Based mm. Medicine. And last year, I have started a class for undergraduate students, real babies, like 18 yeah, year olds the, the first yeah. year, um, because I thought I need to reach further and further back to set people's minds in the right direction. And but it doesn't so this happen that at one point it's too back, it's too young, and it's too far away? It is. No, I, I think, you know, because I'm not a teacher uh, and I don't have to teach very often, uh, it's an experience for me, you know? Like, it's the first time I have encountered such very young people. And uh, it's, um, it's an experience, you know? Yeah. Uh, it was a seminar class, so I always told them at the beginning and end of every class, we are all here to learn from each other. This is true. Because, I mean, you must have heard, you know, universities nowadays are all about diversity, diversity, right. diversity, okay? Yeah, they, they can spend hours <laughs> but, uh, in meetings. Then you and... see that work, you know, like the class is uh, very diverse. Look, so look, look at this dog. Again. Wow. Third? Oh, that's Your fun. dog. It's my dog. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he cannot stand closed doors, so we don't even try. We let him, okay. he's going to fold himself into a bagel. Yeah. And <laughs> are you a physician? No, I'm I mean, not did a physician. you study no. medicine? No? no, 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 no. I'm no. a PhD, in... and my PhD is in neurobiology. Ah. So I was doing research on the brain for many years. I still do a lot of research on the brain. But from the get-go, when I started my PhD dissertation, um, I got interested in sex differences because I was really fortunate. My mentor for my PhD was Lord Professor David Samuel. Nice. And he was a very open-minded person besides being a professor in the Weizmann Institute. <clears throat> and when I came to him uh, to discuss a topic for my PhD thesis in the group on brain and behavior, he said, why don't you go to the library and read stuff and you find something that grabs your heart? This could no, be a dissertation topic, which is very, very wow. unusual. Yes. So I went to the library and I started reading and I found out that women are twice as likely or three times as likely as men to be depressed, to get clinical depression. So that sucks. And then I read some more and I found out that the drugs that are um, being given for depression to men and women, and I'm talking many years back, you know, these drugs are not so popular anymore, but the drugs that were uh, given at the time were less effective in women and produced more side effects. So oh. I thought, well, this is really annoying. I have to get to the bottom of that. So actually in my PhD dissertation that started in 1976 and ended in 1980, and I know I'm sort of aging myself, but what can I do? Uh, the topic was really, um, looking for brain mechanisms in animal models that can explain why females are more susceptible to depression on one hand and less responsive to antidepressant drugs on the other hand. So I started my dive into issues of women's health basically when I started being a yeah. scientist. And what do and you find today compared to then? It's been a, a, a big change in attitude. 
I don't know if that's what you're asking about, but that's what I'm telling you about. Because, you know, when I was doing my thesis, I was, like I said, I was lucky that I had a very liberal, open-minded mentor, and he allowed me to explore this topic. When I became an independent researcher, the climate was completely frigid as far as working on women's issues or um, sex differences is concerned. You couldn't get funding. As, as you probably know, you must have heard that to do science nowadays, you have to have funding. Yes. So mm -hmm. you need to write grant applications to different bodies. <clears throat> and when I tried to get support for research on sex differences or specifically on women's or female health issue as dictated by the uh, hormonal changes that women undergo and men do not undergo. It was a bust. You know, I got um, criticism that I'm ashamed to repeat. Wow. But it all boiled down to, well, why are you, wh why do you want to, to study females? Well, because no one else studies females. Well, uh, everything we know about this disease you're interested in, whatever it was, stroke, et cetera, et cetera, comes from males. And there's no proof that there are sex differences. So one time I was brave and I said, okay, so you think it will be a waste of money and we don't have enough to study both males and females. So I will study only females. This didn't go <laughs> very well either. Like, it's like, how dare you study females? There is a model for human, and it's the male. So this went on for almost 30 years, you know? So I oh. was doing research and when I could afford it, I would sneak in the females under the radar. Like I would get a grant to study males and then I would sneak in the females, but it was really a very um, underappreciated, really despised topic. Like, you know, where is the innovation? Where is the mechanism? Where is the science in this? So you're going to stick males and females in the same cage and look at differences. This is like so low. And then uh, I think that and these were the same times, you know, I'm talking about the eighties, uh, late seventies and the eighties and uh, beginning of the nineties. So during that time in, health research or clinical research, women were actually not allowed to volunteer to the clinical studies, especially the early stage studies. So there was a, um, it's practically a law. So the FDA guidelines, the FDA is the Food and Drug Administration, which is the American mm -hmm. body that approves new drugs. So to get FDA approval for a drug, you have to run through a very structured series of clinical trials starting with early clinical trials involving a small number of people just to uh, assess the safety of yes. the drug, then slightly larger trials involving a few more, like you know, a couple of hundred people to continue assessing the safety and gather um, information on dosing and, and preliminary efficacy. And then you have to do like a phase three trial, which is hundreds and sometimes thousands of subjects to establish <clears throat> that the drug is really beneficial and that it is safe in a larger population. So the FDA in its wisdom has prohibited the participation of women with, mm. they called it uh, childbearing potential in early stage oh. clinical trials. And when you, you think they were worried that um, this uh, testing women can, uh, can hurt, can the, hurt embryos. the embryos or the womb. Or... Yeah, they were not worried about the women. They were worried about the potential features, wow. uh, which is, you know, pretty paternalistic and in line with the uh, view of women as vessels to produce children. So, be because, you know, when I tell my students about this nowadays, they say, Oh, so they thought the drugs will be less safe for women. So no, 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 no. They worry that the drugs may not be safe for a fetus. Yeah. So childbearing potential basically covers all females between the age of 14 and the age of 50 plus. You know, I think that most 
students cannot even comprehend the level of uh, conservatism in the United States. They cannot get it. It's hard to it's hard to believe that it still exists to that level. Yeah, well, Although, but they hear you know, now that is, you cannot have abortion. Yeah, yes, is, so, so this this policy was in in place until 1993. Wow, so late. Uh, pretty late, yeah. Wow. Uh, well, I always tell in the, in the same context that uh, women in Switzerland got the vote in 1971. Yeah. And Switzerland is important in this regard when we're talking about health, because for many, many decades, and it hasn't changed much, the Swiss pharma industry dominated the pharma industry. So what drugs are going to be developed and how they're going to be tested was determined by Swiss people, by Swiss men, okay? And, come and this yeah. is the nation that gave its women the vote later than any other country. But Anand, you also spoke about the, the use of the medication that wasn't really built for women then and today. So this is where I'm going to, so this policy was in place in, until 93 and in 93 it has changed. The reason it's changed, I think, is because this was the time when the um, National Institute of Health in the United States uh, appointed its first woman director. Okay. So this was Dr. Bernadine Healy. She was the first female director of the NIH. And one of the first things she did when she took office was to assemble a panel of experts to study the question of whether sex is a biological factor that affects health. And surprise, they said, yes, 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 anywhere we look, sex is a very uh, important and um, sort of unchangeable factor. So we need to learn about it. So this is when the FDA changed its policy and basically flipped the policy. So it became uh, the guidelines became that uh, women have to be included in clinical trials and the data from the clinical trials needs to be stratified by sex. You have to analyze the side effect profile separately for men and women. Sense. And NIH changed its policy at the same time. So NIH basically governs um, research that is done with NIH support. So Which just is most of the, the biomedical 90s, research. Only, only 1993. The 90s? Yeah, this happened okay. in 1993. Uh, you know, I lose, so, I lose track of time, but I remember it doesn't seem to me so long ago. It's, it's definitely not long ago if you're talking about medication. Yes. Right. Because it takes 15 years on the average between the idea for a new drug and until a and new drug is, yeah. is you yeah, know, what, allowed. What worried me, so, they didn't attach much important, I don't know how to say it, but as far as heart attacks, like I think the data about women uh, were not really out until very, not, not long. Yeah. So they generalize, they still generalize. It's not like you presented that men get different uh, signs and women get different signs. They still generalize yeah. in one pocket this is what you if you feel this and this and that that's what you have well you and know you you asked me what changed so this is what is changing so changes are happening i just want to close yes the discussion about the drugs and what you know 93 is it late or is it not late <clears throat> so considering how long it takes to put new drugs on the market most of the drugs that we are taking today were developed before 93. Right. So we are still taking, we women as well as men, many drugs that are like the uh, uh, linchpins of therapy in cardiovascular as well as uh, infection, as well as, you know, most of the drugs we are taking today were developed before 93. So we are still suffering and now I'm talking about women. We women are still suffering from the big hole in knowledge that was created by excluding women from clinical trials before 93. Now, after 93, women are now included in clinical trials. The other thing that happened 
<clears throat> is that um, not only the NIH director became a, a female, there are more and more women who got into medicine and more and more women who got into biomedical research. So Anat, when I think that when a, a new drug is presented, the hospitals ask the doctors to choose or to, to recommend which one, if it's good for them, if it's not good for them, do they, do they already change? They say, maybe we should try one for men and one for women, or they, they just ask the, the doctors to choose and they choose one for everybody? Uh, the process doesn't work exactly this way. You know, doctors have an auto autonomy and they choose the drugs. I don't know that the hospital asks questions or that, you know, if you are an attending physician in a hospital, you have autonomy and as an MD, you can prescribe any drug for anything. So it takes time for the knowledge to be assimilated. Mm -hmm. So again, um, this is where we need to be, where you have specific drugs and specific dosing uh, tailored to men and women. We're very far from there. So again, the first occurrence that sort of matches the scenario you're uh, talking about. And again, the recommendations for those and the approval of drugs comes from the FDA, not from the hospital. If the mm -hmm. FDA approves the drug, MDs can prescribe it. And they can prescribe it for the indication for the disease it was approved for. But in principle, an MD can prescribe a drug that is approved for anything. Oh, really? So this is called off-label use. So there's a lot of off-label use going on because physicians hear from colleagues or friends or reading the literature that a drug that was approved for one thing is actually good for something else. They can prescribe it. Without, but, without uh, take it trials? Nobody? No, it, it's trials, yes, but it's without uh, constriction. It's not that the hospital tells you what you can use. No, 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 no. I mean, they can prescribe Without it. specific efficacy trials for the other indication. Right. So, these drugs that are approved for human use, it means that they pass the, um, the toxicology testing and the side effects and they're considered safe at the doses approved by FDA. Yeah. So the safety is done. As far efficacy is a drug that was designed initially for the treatment of diabetes. I'm talking about a real example. So is this drug also useful for obesity? There were no specific trials no. for obesity. The no. drug was approved for diabetes, but then word of mouth, you yes. know, people found out that it yeah. actually yeah. works well for obesity. So for, you know, quite a while, physicians were prescribing this drug to people who just wanted to be, uh, you know, to lose weight and had um, obesity, obesity related risk factors for serious disease. And um, in the United States, this drug was approved for use in obesity just uh, in July of last year. Wow. But people were taking it for a long time. So this is a prime example of off-label use that then led, you know, once the company that makes the drug realized that there is a huge market there, they actually went ahead and did clinical trials directly for obesity. And now the drug is approved for obesity, but it was given before for diabetes. But I want to tell you the story of the first drug that got at least separate labels for men and women. And this drug is called Ambien. It's a sleep medication. So it's a relatively new drug. It was approved uh, first time, I think like 20 years ago. So which, which was already in the period when women were supposed to be included in the clinical trials. So in the clinical trials for Ambien, women were included. And drug companies and recipients of grants now make sure that women are included in the clinical trials. What is not happening yet is the stratification of the adverse effects by sex. No one is doing that, you know, because- and What I didn't understand the last sentence. What the FDA indicated they want to happen is that men, both men and women will be included in clinical trials Right. And then the statistical analysis okay. will be done separately for men and women. Right. So if there is a difference in the side effect profile between men and women, it will be seen. Otherwise, if you analyze everyone together, yeah. anything may happen. You can have, uh, you know, um, 
good safety profile in men and lousy safety profile in women. But if you have more men than women in the study, it will be washed out, it will be diluted. So this is what happened as often as not. If you do not separate the uh, analysis by sex, you get a mixture. Right. You know, it's so weird because if you think about all the women pills, only for us, they study on women, they cannot do it on men. It's obvious that there's a difference between the women body and the men body. This is so weird. What we, what that pills we get just women? It's only yeah. only the only. The... only? <laughs> only? Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I really I'm curious. What are you? you know, I think it was talking? only birth control. The birth control and the hormones yeah. and yeah, uh, that's it. it's not a it's a big chunk. Yeah, but uh, um, you know these are drugs that are not going to be tested in men because men do not have. The yeah, you cannot you can you cannot keep uh, handling things like to avoid women while you're handling women separately and you know that there's so a big okay. so you know this, this could this could be a, a, another interesting discussion okay. but okay. you know do you know how birth control was approved the, the process of development of birth controls it's amazing uh at the time <laughs> that the idea for the birth control pills was um, put forward, it was illegal in the United States to test or give any drugs that will, um, but that, will that will cause, you know, that will endanger fertility or- um, For religious reasons? So there was separation of, but, you know, state and religion yeah, in the like US. They don't, they don't like of it course, for religion yeah. reasons, but it's, they, it, they never called it that. You know, why are there rules? Of, why are there laws against abortion? Yeah, it's the same. same. You know, exactly. it's it's the religion infiltrating yes. people's decisions. So it's called they put morality. It under ethics. Yeah, they call it ethics. Yeah. So um, the way the um, contraceptives were presented was as an aid for fertility. Oh. <laughs> it, it, it was really clever. Well, so the idea was that if you give a hormone that stops ovulation, which is what contraceptives do, right. and then you stop, you will have a rebound. Right. Oh. OK? So this was the rationale, the presented <coughs> rationale. So the. Um, the testing of these drugs was in the context of improving fertility. Unbelievable. And the actual clinical trials were carried out in Puerto Rico, Jeez. not in the US proper. Why was So that? it's like, you know, because every time I say, uh, you know, women were not included in clinical trials, you know, if they had capacity to say, well, how about contraceptives? Well, contraceptives were developed in Puerto Rico. <laughs> Amazing. Tell me something. And presented what? as fertility drugs. Yes. So, <laughs> to what degree, uh, when I need to finish the story about Ambien, I'm oh, sorry, right, 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 Ambien, you know, right, right, <laughs> because right, right. it's it's the only example and it tells the story. So, Ambien was developed about twenty years ago, and uh, given to men and women, mostly to women because women are more likely to suffer from uh, insomnia than men, and. There has been so there is a uh, one of the things that FDA does is that after a drug is approved, they keep collecting information from users about adverse effects. There's something called phase four studies that there is a registry, if you will, a database of adverse effects. And what they noticed is that there was a huge number of reports, mostly from women, of Patients waking up the morning after they took the pill, getting in the car and getting into an accident. Whoa. Injuries, fatalities, you name it. So the company wanted to change the formulation. Bottom line, they brought in men and women, all taking the same dose, the recommended dose, 10 milligram, and they put them in a driving simulator in the morning after. And the women were they couldn't. You know, making accidents right, left and center. 
So they took blood samples from the men and the women, and they found out that in the morning, after taking the recommended dose of Ambien, women had two to four higher levels of the drug still in their circulation compared to men. <laughs> because women are smaller, so if you give men and women the same dose, and everything else is the same, the women are overdosed. So they wake up in the morning with dangerous levels of a sleep medication. Right, wow. So the FDA took note of this and they made the company change the dosing information that comes. So, you know, if you open a drug packet, you, you will see there is a little piece of paper rolled yeah. inside. It's called the package insert. And there the company is supposed to say everything related to the drug mechanism, safety, dosing, results of tests, adverse effects, et cetera. So they made the company change the dosing. So it is sex specific. It's the first example of its kind. It happened not so long ago. It happened in wow, 2013. Wow, wow. So now if you open the package insert, but this of course, translate directly to the, the physician. The physician will prescribe whatever the FDA approved. So the FDA basically changed its dosing approval. So now if you look at Ambien, it says recommended dose for men, 10 milligrams, the same as it was before. Recommended dose for women, five milligrams. Five, wow. So the recommended dose of the sleep medication for women is half of what yeah. it is for men. Amazing. Do we think for a moment that Ambien is the only drug with this problem? For no. sure not. For sure not. But nothing there's is a lot of information and a growing amount of information as more women are getting into biomedical research and into medicine. And it be becomes a reasonable field of research. We get more and more and more information about drugs that are you, you know, don't, don't forget, I, I told you a story that happened in 1975. In 1975, we already knew that antidepressants are less effective and have more side effects in right. women. women. But no one did anything about it. Now we know that this is true for the vast majority of cardiovascular drugs, less efficient in women and cause more side effects. But no one has changed the, the dosing know. or the indication for these drugs. Yeah, yeah, I know that I'm taking Lipitor like my husband at the same dose. Well, now yeah. it's different. It's, it's called Rosa's and everyone. Yeah, but it's yeah. I know. we all it's take. Different. Okay, it's so different. Different. I always it's... say that it's really strange. I tell him, oh, I just, I just finished. Can I take one or two? Before and I you see, this is why it was important for me to go and teach babies like the 18 year olds, because yeah. they were as surprised as you are. Yeah. I am. When I teach this to medical students who are at the end of medical school, they're not surprised. Oh, so they, they are, are already, already educated. indoctrinated. Right. Okay. But tell me something, what about the hysteria <laughs> factor? I mean, we perceived women as hyster hysterical creatures, Any, right? So the, when we come and we complain, how often they say, oh, this is in your head. Oh, it's, yeah, yeah, this is the second most common killer of women besides overdose of drugs. So, you know, it's a huge factor. It's very hard to get it through. Again, you know, it, I had more luck with my under, with the babies than with the medical students. So hysteria as an entity, as a disease, was kicked out of the Diagnostic Statistical mm -hmm. Manual uh, already. But it lives in people's minds and physicians from this yeah. viewpoint are people. And it lives in men's minds and it lives in women's minds. Mm -hmm. So what I do when I start my class with the uh, medical students, I ask them a question. It took me some time to find one question that encapsulates the whole thing. So I tell them, and it's a fact, uh, women in the United States are twice as likely to go to the doctor compared to men. They utilize medical services more. Why do you think that is? And I ask them to 
Well, What's their not. opinion? They said, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. We don't really know the answer. But here's the fact. Tell me what you think. What is the reason women are more likely to go to a doctor's office relative to men? And <clears throat> I started teaching this class in 2016. And in the beginning, I was shocked at what I got back. <clears throat> now I'm not shocked anymore around 80% of the students. And these are people who are going to be doctors in, th in three months, okay? This is the, oh, the last yes. semester in medical school. And then they're going for residency where they're already performing as doctors. And what they say is the following. Women go to the doctor more because women are indoctrinated that it's okay to ask for help. And they take, they are more in tune with their bodies and they are more likely to feel that something is wrong and they are less ashamed to go and check whether something is wrong. Uh, and some of the students even say, the question actually should be put it in the head. It's not why women go more often, it's why men go less often. Grow enough. Because men are um, taught to be strong and they have to be macho and they cannot ask for help. So they will wait and, you know, somebody goes, so I, I read things like, so men will only, only go to the doctor when something really serious is happening. The implication being that women go to the doctors for things that are not serious. Yeah. Men will only go to the doctor if the situation is life-threatening, which means women are going to doctors for things that are not life-threatening. And then I even got this uh, sweetie, that I thought I will not see anymore. Many women choose to stop working or work part-time so they can stay home and raise the children. So they have time wow. to go to the doctor. Oh, yeah, yeah. Spoken from the height of a 23 year old who of course doesn't have children. And you know, the men, this is a woman who wrote this, okay? So, so this is the bias, you know, that it's women like, are, you know, it's much easier for, and then they go like, you know, sometimes women uh, start going to doctors when they uh, reach puberty because they're told they have to go to an OBGYN every year. So they got, get into the habit of going to doctors. And then I had another doozy, which was uh, because women take care of the, health of the whole family. Of course, women are in charge of the children's health and the husband's health and, and everyone else's health. So when a, a mother is making an appointment for little Timmy, she also uses this opportunity to make an appointment for herself. And it's like, yeah, when you are a working mother, or even if you're a non-working mother, you either have time to take your child to the doctor or to take yourself to the doctor. You know, it's this completely unreal, stereotype, ages know, old thing. But that, it's all cultural and sure. social and ethical. And when you see people come to, to the United States from other cultures, they change because they don't really do the same what's going on here they follow what the culture in their own country is doing but the unfortunate thing is that not only science is dragging along the whole attitude yes the whole attitude and it's very hard to change people's minds the answers you okay, got so that I women are not class. serious we pay them less also yes but you know we uh, no it's really <laughs> let's, no no let's really follow, like, it's all it's let's, let's it's follow all... one line at a time so we are talking about but the it's bias. all mixed yeah no, we, mixed. we're talking, I mean, we started talking about yeah but you know one line at a time so we started talking about the bias okay right there is a very strong provider bias provider being physician nurses etc people who give uh medical care that puts women in the position of being whiners, complainers, weak, hysterical, emotional, and looking for, you know, treatment where none is really necessary or indicated. And this costs lives, okay? 
Sure, of course. And this is bias and it is culturally, socially determined. Going back to hysteria and Freud, I spit on his grave every time I go to his grave because it's his fault. Um, so then these students are involved in a very intensive class, takes a month, they meet three times a week, and they hear about all of the disorders, diseases, and pathologies that women are more likely to, to get than men or that affect exclusively women. And they hear about all of the drugs that women get in inappropriate doses that give them side effects and they have to change drugs and change drugs until they find something that uh, doesn't you know, give them the side, awesome. uh, side effects. And at the end of this month, I asked them to answer the question again. And what I see, and this is what keeps me going, is that the number of people who invoke the stereotype, basically, as a reason, goes down from 80% to less than 20%. And even the ones who still invoke this reason, they have learned and they say things like, which is where I'm trying to get them, and this year, I think it's the first time I got the full uh, um, change, Classic. the full change, the flip. What they recognize is they said, considering how many chronic, untreatable, incurable diseases women have that, that are more likely to get than men, and considering all of the disorders and pathologies that women have that men do not have at all, the ratio shouldn't have been two to one. It should be more. It should be a lot more. To get adequate medical care, women require a lot more yeah. services and a lot more visits. And the reason it's only two to one is because it is true. Women are in charge of the health of the whole family and they always put themselves last. Yeah. So by the time they've taken the kids to the uh, um, to the doctor and by the time they've taken their elderly mother and their elderly father to the doctor they don't have time for their own health and this is one more thing that my students learn in my class because they hear it from one doctor after the other after the other is that when women finally get a diagnosis and get treated they are in a much worse shape so women who have arthritis of the knee and need knee replacement. <clears throat> By the time they get sent for knee replacement, they are much further gone. And unsurprisingly, because of that, when they have the knee replacement, their final outcome is not as good as the men. When women finally come in and get a diagnosis of heart disease and are sent for, um, stent placement, etc. they are much sicker than the men. They are less likely to get the interventions they need. It's amazing so, because we- So we it's a combination. Yeah. So, so, so the women don't, don't recognize that they have heart disease because the symptoms are different. Even if they think something is wrong with their heart, they have the kids and the mothers and the fathers, they don't have time. And then when but they finally make the effort, I think, I'm sorry. But, and not both men and women, many are afraid to go and check and find. So they just put it aside. Uh, and then they have, they use excuses. Men like, don't put aside. Oh, men, yes, goes, do. men don't they feel do. well. I'm they talking have, about they clues. They behave yeah. like they have, uh, I don't know what. I'm talking about facts and observations. Men okay. Men so, uh, you know, it's like, we can speculate, we all know people and we sort of assume yeah, that right. this is it. The, 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 the question is really bottom line, what happens when you finally get the, the appropriate test and the appropriate diagnosis? So I'm telling you that the fact of the matter is that women get to treatment and diagnosis Too later late. and in worse shape. And then the outcome of the treatment is worse for them. Okay. So you know, when women finally get the uh, stent placement or the surgery for heart disease that they need, their likelihood of dying from the treatment is significantly higher than the men. 
So regardless of what we think, because you know that's the difference between large group statistics and science and people's impressions, right. okay? Yes. Because you know uh, men who put off um, going to the doctor and you know men who don't. And I know men, so my father, for example, all of his life was really worried about heart disease. Men worry about heart disease, yes. women worry about breast cancer, if you want yes. another cliche, right. okay? Heart disease kills a lot more women than, than breast cancer does. Yes. Heart disease is know the major yeah, killer yeah, of both men and women. The chances today of dying of breast cancer are much, much lower right. than the chances of that. But women are still you know, fixated on the yeah. breast cancer yeah. and men are fixated on, on heart disease. So my father who was never sick ever, if his temperature went above 36.8, he would go to bed. He felt he was dying. And then my mother had a heart attack when she was 61. And she was given um, uh, patches, you know, naturally some patches to put on her skin. My father would steal her patches and put them on his skin. Oh my God. Because he was so sure that he's going to die of heart disease. And guess what he did? So he was healthy, he was healthy, he was healthy. My mother had a heart attack at 61, and then she had uh, angina for the rest of her life. When my father was 77, out of the blue, he had a major massive heart attack. He was in a hospital and it was followed by another major heart attack in the hospital that killed him. And none of this is unusual. Okay, so one of the reasons that yeah. women require more medical care and more intervention is that the kind of diseases that women are more likely to have are the chronic, incurable, barely treatable disease that do not kill you, they just make your life miserable. I'm but, talking about but Alzheimer's you know, disease. It's a, there's a chain of side effects that is all mixed and, and, and comes. Unfortunately, it goes together because it's really uh, beyond the personal character it's the everything that you're talking about medicine plus the behavior of the environment and the family yeah. and the society and companies and yeah, but it all goes in the same direction that's right it's cumulative and this, is, know, what, this is what i hope to teach my students and yeah. this is why when i ask them the question the first time I don't tell them that they have to mention more than one reason. Yeah. You know, just say wh whatever you think. Right. And what they think, 80% of them, is the stereotype, okay? It's very- When I ask this question the second time, right. I tell them, and every time I mention another disease state that is more likely to have a movement, another side effect, I say, these things are not mutually exclusive, they're cumulative. Yeah. The, so the societal factors, add to the drug side effect. Yeah, we are here, we're here. And, okay, and they <laughs> add to the longevity. Women live longer. If yes. you live longer, you're more likely to get sick. Yes. A lot of diseases yeah. are age related. Right. So if you have this extra years at the end of life, you will get more diseases. Something, yeah. And it's none of this is exclusive of the other they all add up and they all add up in the same direction. So mm -hmm. where it adds up and ends up is that women get inferior medical care. Until now, you know, if you tell me it's only ambience and all. Now. Absolutely I still get now. the same dose like my husband. Yeah. And I was, I was asking, I was questioning it, but, but you know, yeah. also if, uh, you mentioned also that women are, are more de getting more depressed than men. Yeah. Did you know? The ratio that? of yeah. depression is two to three mm -hmm. higher, you know, yeah. in women than in men, although this is restricted to a specific age range. Like what? Between puberty and mm -hmm. a few years after menopause. Right. Oh, okay. So women during the reproductive years, so it, it's really striking how this behaves because 
there is such a thing as childhood depression. You must have yes, heard about right, it. We right, know about right. children who try to commit right, suicide. Right. We know yes. about children who commit suicide, okay? Yeah. So if you look at the rates of depression in children, they are exactly the same in boys and girls. From age 14, 15 and up, the women just shoot up. So if you look at women between or girls between the age of 16, 20 and the age of 50, 60, there is three women with depression for every man with depression. Yeah. Then if you look at the 70 year olds, 80 year olds, the difference disappears. Mm -hmm. And depression is not the only disorder that behaves this way. There are other much more um, acceptably biological disorders that show this pattern. There are other disorders that show a different pattern. There are there is a number of disorders that are more common in men than in women, especially neurological, neuropsychiatric disorders that affect young that affect young people. So you know about autism. It's a childhood disease. It's diagnosed yeah. in childhood. It yeah. lasts forever. Right. So the likelihood of a boy being diagnosed with autism is four to five times higher than the yes. likelihood of a girl. Yeah. yeah. You and know then about why? Somebody's doing your research. Why? People are now doing research about why. Even now. We have, even now. We have theories. Including girls in studies of autism is a completely new thing. And what? Girls what? Including them in studies of mm. autism is okay. new. So, so, you know, the way it works is the following. If a disease is more common in boys or men than in women, of course you do not study it in girls because they are the minority. If a disease is more common in women than in men, you still study it in men because you're used to it. Wow. Women are complicated. They have menstrual cycle, ah, you know. Nice. So <laughs> in basic research, unless you force people tend to study disorders in males only. And once, when they are forced to include women in clinical trials, they start including women, but the preclinical research where the drugs are born, they were mm -hmm. still 95% yeah. done in males, regardless of what population was more likely to have the disease. So for example, all pain disorders, all diseases where pain is the leading symptom are more common in women than in men. But if you look at studies of pain in animal models, which is where the new pain medications are being developed, only males. For years and years and years and years and many years. The, the first study, large study that included females to look at a pain mechanism and response to a new drug was 2015. So male is the default and people have all sorts of excuses. But with autism, where it's a majority man, you know, of course they were studied only men. Now they're beginning to study autism in girls. It looks different. Another one you know and love is ADHD, attention deficit yeah. hyperactivity yeah. disorder. Right. Much more common in boys than in girls. Mm -hmm. Most of the studies of ADHD in the drug development was done in boys only. Now they're beginning to include girls in studies of ADHD. The profile is different. It looks different. Heart disease looks different. Heart attack looks different. ADHD looks different. Of course. Different. But for so you, you know, yeah, but, yeah. but you are not surprised. I'm not surprised, no. Well, I'm not but either. I've been doing this for 40 years. <laughs> I'm not surprised. It's just, you know, you, I'm trying to, to be he uh, hopeful because it is now on the spot of trying to change things, but it's quite upsetting. Because Very upsetting. There are much more money, I think, invested in how to avoid certain things and how to, to change certain things, like all around women and their monthly cycle, uh, how to push it to be equal to men and not to basically create a situation for women to be more comfortable. It's all on the wrong side of the of the, I agree of the with problem you and the, oh, and the I issue. I think it's and going it's in the wrong annoying. direction. Yeah, I agree with you 100% because, and again, it's the prevailing thing is that, and right. also in social sciences and, and, and you know, education, 
the prevailing spirit is that if women want to do better, they have to become more like men. Yeah. Yes. Which I think is scary and, and, and complete, like, you know, I look at all of this push of, you know, getting girls into STEM, you know, into science. And yeah. Why should girls go into STEM if they don't want to? Well, I'm, I'm because also- Because that's I'm, their only chance I'm to thinking. compete with men. Who wants to compete? You know, if you pay teachers what you pay stupid video game developers, you know, a stupid video game developers, which is a very no, they're not, idea. They're not necessarily stupid. It's not necessarily most stupid. of them. Are. Just, most of the no, games. It's like you know. I, I think that compared no to nursing and education, it's stupid. I can't. You know, how much money is rolled around in sports, competitive sports, American football, American football players. You know, a serious. You know, a woman would never consider wasting so much money on games yeah right you know you well, can buy, you you can buy better with... food for your children you can educate your children better this is part of you know the male obsession with competition but not, you know that one of the problems i think that our society is trying to convince itself that we are progressive and they they get confused between real progress and a technological development. And it's a very big you. difference because we are not really progressive. Right. When we come to handle you certain things, we're not but, but you know, I direct films and uh, you cannot even imagine how many times uh, people are surprised that the woman can even be a director because you have mm -hmm. a big crew and you are actually the, you know, and in school we have, now 50 50 women at Tish mm -hmm. coming to want to, to learn, you know, to yeah. become, and most of them wants to be director. But by the, by the third year, they change their minds. They are Will you be to surprised be if I tell you it's the same thing in medicine? Yeah, really? No? <laughs> so now? by now, yeah, so by the, exactly the same picture that you des described 50% of medical students are women. When you go up and you look how many are department chairs in hospitals, how many are deans yeah. of medical schools, how many make professor, okay. you know, it goes down. I'm very upset. Down. I think you're on a mission. You are on a mission, very important mission. I'm I've so glad that we joined them oh in a small life. way, the mission. That's really... Definitely. Anat, what do you have to tell us a little bit cheerful? <laughs> <laughs> well, things are changing. They're changing slowly, good. but they're changing. Very good. More and more women are hired, and there is a awareness of the need for diversity in medical school and medical care. And there is more and more research, and there is more and more push. It's changing. It's changing slowly, but I think societal changes are slow. Right. But it's changing in the right direction right. you know after 40 years of living in the desert and not being able to get grant support for studies of sex differences i now got it wow i got a grant to study sex differences in health disease. unbelievable unbelievable first time in four years it was amazing it was this so is, interesting this is a good end up for the show Fantastic. <laughs> thank you Anna, so much thank you and thank everybody thank and see you all Next Thanks week. Next Bye. week. Thank you. See you don't Bye. Bye. It was Bye. nice meeting.